Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are excited to have you join us for our first session in the Structured for Scale series. So we're here together today to give you an overview of Team of Three. My name is Amy, and I am the Director of Operations here at Dillon Business Advisors. And with me, I have Marcus, the President. Marcus, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. It is, it's great to be here. We are super excited. And before we get into what we are covering, um, I'm going to give you an overview of the series, but let me back up one step there. So today, Marcus and I, we want to have fun with all of you for the next hour. We're glad that you're here. This is exciting. Uh, we want to cover, just regarding Team of Three, an overview of it. So why consider it and a little bit of the history at DBA and some input from Marcus on the journey that we've been on here. What specifically is Team of Three? And keeping it very simple, where do you see impact regarding Team of Three inside of your firms? When should you be implementing it? Because it is February right now and we're talking about this. And how to get started, right? How do we actually make this happen? So before we dive into that, let's talk about the series that we put together. Marcus and Rachel and I, uh, Rachel's in the background, so I'll give her a shout out there. Uh, she's managing questions. If you have questions, send them through. But there's a lot of really good content surrounding Team of Three, and we've we've experienced the benefits of it inside of DBA. And so in, in an effort to not cram it all down your throat in an hour session, we've broken it up into four sessions. Overview today, some insight into Marcus's brain, and then diving into the financial advantages of it and really digging into the numbers with some insight into what it looked like inside of DBA over the years, then getting into, okay, cool, we know the financial impact of it. What are the roles and responsibilities? How does it affect the team? And then once we have a solid handle on that, okay, how do we roll this out to clients? What does successful execution look like? And now we're live and running with it. And then it's just a continual tweak. So that's what we're excited to bring to you over the course of this series, but we won't spend too much time there. Let's get into the reason why we're here right now. Marcus. It's February 8th, um, it's tax season, right? We're feeling the crunch. What, like take us back to where we've been inside of DBA and then where other accounting firms are also at right now, just what's being felt. Yeah, uh, and so to talk about Team of Three and DBA, I'll just say for those of you that are here, like this is all real data, real experience. This isn't theory. This is stuff that we have lived through, pain points that we've had to figure out. And a lot of those are probably pain points that you have in your firm as well. So our early days, hopefully they don't look like your tax season right now, but our early days were filled with a lot of overtime, a lot of annual tax relationships, people that we didn't see on an ongoing basis. We all only saw them once a year, but in their mind, we were their team. We were their people to ask financial questions, tax questions, and they assumed that we knew everything about their financial picture and we're always giving them the best advice. So in those early days, it was long days, a lot of clients. At one time, we had over 2,000 tax engagements in UltraTax, which is our tax software, which we were using, uh, still use to this day. And it was just too much. And so being, uh, you know, having a family and other responsibilities in life, there were things that I wanted uh, to achieve other than being at the office and serving annual clients uh, all hours of the day during this time of year. And then I also wanted that for our team. Um, so our team, uh, some of them that were there in those early days are actually still with us today and some have evolved and we'll talk about different roles and things over this series. But, um, you know, it was just our calling to lead a small team and to want better for them 
as well. So better relationships for them, better quality of life, uh, and a uh, a point of satisfaction that they were able to achieve something in their day, not just crank through a puzzle of a tax return. Yeah, a lot. 2,000 tax returns. That's a lot. I think we and, were like 2,400, 2,200. Um, so, but I, I can say with confidence, 2,000. So how were like capacity issues then, right? Because there, you were servicing monthly clients also then, in addition to all of these annual clients, right? Yeah, so our team was a variety of different positions and roles and part of like why we're at where we're at today is because we structured things uh, with different responsibilities and kind of have some overlap, which we'll talk about. But we had people that um, they were in charge of maybe an audit, they were in charge of a payroll for a client, some, some team members were in charge of tax and they only did tax, maybe they only did individual tax or business tax. What we did is we had a small team, but we created a ton of different silos and silos of work and we weren't able to fully serve the client by knowing their complete situation. So um, all of that just goes into, we were doing way too many services for way too many clients and knew something had to change. And as a part of that, I think all firm owners, all business owners probably get to that breaking point. And for us, our breaking point was in 2017 and it was just exhaustion, way too many clients. We were still in office at that time. That was uh, before COVID. And it was just, it was one of those things that you have to experience pain to want to change and want to want better. Yeah, it has to set you over the edge, right? It's not until it's greater than what you're currently experiencing. So everybody is likely experiencing some type of pain right now, right? I mean, it's February, which is why we're talking about this. So capacity was an issue inside of DBA, internal communication, right, with the silos of what did someone else do for a client that didn't get communicated to the tax preparer. Um, expectations, client service was also just diminished slightly way back then. How was we were pricing? Still, we were still doing way better than the firms down the street, don't get us wrong, but it wasn't at the level that we knew we could be at. Right, striving for better, always striving for better. How was pricing with all of that back then? So pricing, uh, we lived in the world of being a commodity. So we were a tax return, which is a commodity. And if you're a firm owner or a firm leader, uh, there's no getting around it, right? So I think we were trying to price our services aggressively to break out of the shell of being seen as a commodity, but even then you can continue to raise prices and ultimately you have to provide value to some extent beyond just a compliance filing. So pricing was okay. Uh, I've always pushed the envelope on pricing and would rather a client leave on pricing than service, but, um, but still you still have limits because there is a market value on services if it is a commodity. Yeah. So these are all likely challenges, right? Again, that many of you listening, maybe you're feeling one of these, multiple of these, maybe you're just to a breaking point right now. Like maybe this is your 2024 is the year that you are deciding that you are making a change, or maybe you're farther along in your journey. What we'd love to know right now is which of the challenges listed there are most concerning to you and your team. So we'll launch a poll to answer. This session doesn't qualify for CPE, but we love answering polls, right, in this profession. So we love your feedback. What are you struggling with the most, or what is your biggest challenge area inside of your firm right now? And Amy, we do have a few DBA team members on this webinar, so uh, we're hopefully going to track their answer and then follow up with them directly this afternoon. So, Be honest, you guys. Be yeah. honest. We'll let that run for just a few more seconds here. If you put other, feel free to send your reason or your challenge area through the questions panel. 
we'll share those as they come through. All right, it looks like our results are in. So overwhelming capacity, 49%. If it's any of our DBA team members, we got you. Don't worry, we'll have you figure, yeah. figure it out. So incapacity is something we're very familiar with. Uh, we led a whole session on capacity at QB Connect, which it no matter what you do, I think you're always going to have capacity at an issue in your firm. You just have to feel comfortable with how much capacity are you able to give. And professional services, no matter if you're a CPA firm or any other type of professional service, it all comes down to capacity. So getting that in balance is definitely something that we had to figure out as well. Yeah. All right, so challenge areas, right? We all experience them, um, regardless of role inside of the firm. Uh, everyone experiences challenge, opportunity for improvement. So let's get into what is team of three. And I mean, team of three, I'll take a stab at it. And then Marcus, if you want to interpret whatever I say here, feel free. Yeah, but this will be a really good test for you to, to explain this back and then we can fill in the gaps. So. Exactly, yes teamwork here. So team of three is, I like to think of it simply as a, a way to structure. It's a way to structure your team in order to create a team approach to servicing your clients. So what do you think, Marcus? Are you doing all right? Hey, structure is the key word there. <laughs> structure is super important. So let's just talk roles inside of team of three, because these roles are happening in accounting firms all across the country, across the world, right? You have, in our world, our client service managers are doing our bookkeeping, reconciliations, payroll, sales tax. Not everything is on that list there, right? But those are just some of the highlights. We have our client controllers doing tax, prep, planning, projections, reviewing monthly work, producing financial statements, monthly financials, and then we have our CFOs. Marcus, what do our CFOs do, you being one of them? Uh, so a CFO can range, um, and, and all three of these areas are advisors, right? So whenever you talk about advisory and that word that nobody can define, it seems, um, each one of these roles are an advisor to the clients. Um, as a client CFO myself, I lead a pod still. And so as a CFO, I am going over financial data that our team, uh, the controllers and the CSMs work through, and I have full confidence in to then speak into with our clients and help them make decisions, help reinforce feelings that they're having in their business. I just had a 10 o'clock call with a monthly CFO client this morning, and they had a rough January. And so a lot of times it's being there and saying, as an even headed person that can separate from emotion, this is what I see in your business. And this is the approach that we take over the next six weeks to get out of this situation. And oh yeah, you shouldn't feel so bad because here's the real results that you should be looking at or rolling 12 months or whatever that could be. And so all of that exists in most of the people on this call's brain, right? But we're all too busy to have those relationships with the clients that value it. And so for us, it was, that is what I wanted to do as a firm owner. So I just put the pieces in place to where I could go focus on what I enjoyed doing. I love how these three roles get explained as present, past, and future. Can you can you let everyone on this call today know, like what's the explanation behind yeah, this? Yeah, so most people are probably familiar, uh, you know, the, the Christmas story, right? You know, past, present, and future, the three different ghosts. So when explaining this to a prospect or to a client, we've had really good success in explaining that the client service manager or accountant or bookkeeper or whatever you may call that person in your firm, they're in charge of the present. So they are actively working in the accounting. The QuickBooks file, they're actively helping file current um, sales tax returns, reconciliations. They're in the payroll on a semi-monthly, bi-weekly basis, whatever that is. So you can easily see that they are in charge of the present. 
The next position up is that client controller. So they are in charge of the past. And much like that ghost from the Christmas story or Christmas Carol, um, they're taking you and looking back historically. So they are the ones issuing those previous month's financials. They're also addressing the previous period's tax return, right? So I think that's the piece where having the present and the past work together then sets up the client CFO to speak into, you guessed it, the future, right? So I think those are the pieces that you can build upon the future because of where you've been in the past and where you're at in the present. And we've, the whole thing with team of three and these titles, we adopted the language that our prospects could understand. And so as we're talking through what our team could do for these clients, we started to adopt this language externally and then we adopted it internally as well because a lot of firms may say you have an accountant one or a senior or a staff or whatever those things are nobody knows outside of your firm what those levels mean and so this has been really good for not only internal team members to understand where they're at in that service model but then also externally with prospects and clients super important that they understand what they're getting with the services that are being offered so that's a breakdown of the roles we have a whole nother session right where we'll dive farther into what is specifically done week daily weekly monthly etc and so not to dive too far into that right now but if we then talk about the structure right, the team of three structure, then ultimately it is what I have displayed here on the screen for all of us is just a way to have that team approach yep. where we have potentially seven people involved in the team servicing how many clients? Depends, right? It depends on how much you want to charge for this model too. So in DBA, which we'll we'll get into this in the financial kind of aspect one, um, if you have a service model like a team of three, you have to charge a premium for that, which has helped us maintain less clients. So this is what we would call a full pod. And this is assuming every one of these roles is an FTE. And that being the case, we calculate that a full pod could handle up to 150 relationships, which 150 relationships is pretty important whenever you study um what's the what's the term there the the law uh, i guess uh, yeah it's on the tip of my tongue somebody so will some, message it in someone will message us uh, but um there is a a common um number that dunbar. The number of, you, dunbar, uh, so the number of relationships that you can maintain is around 150 and then you've also got smaller groups that go down and more cl closer knit relationships all the way up to on the other side of that 150, you have what may be acquaintances or loose connections. When we were a firm that wasn't focused on a certain number of relationships, we had a lot of acquaintances. And so we wanted to get into where our, our clients were actually relationships that we had on an ongoing basis. So that being said, this full pod of seven, we've capped it at 150, no more. Yeah. So in this pod layout, let me ask a question that Jennifer sent through. So what about having a tax preparer and a reviewer for quality control? And so yeah. can you answer uh, that for us, Marcus? So we actually, there's a few things that you can look at. You could have a cross review between controllers because controllers will have that tax background. So you could have technical review done by another controller in the pod if there's capacity. You could also, once you expand, um, you could have a tax director role or a tax director of counsel role like we have. And that person is available as needed to have a technical review on tax. The client CFO may also have a tax background. Um, I have a loose tax background. I have a very gray tax background. Um, Leslie, who is another client CFO here, she doesn't have a tax background. So we rely on the tax director of counsel or the tax expertise in the in the house, so to speak, with the controllers. Yeah, You're, you have a loose tax background. I like that, Marcus. Um, all right. So 
What I would love is for you to take us on the journey of Team of Three, because Joe, this is going to address your question about how do you, how does the pod breakout really look as far as how many teams of three exist? And so I think the journey that DBA has gone on will be super helpful for everyone. Yeah. And this, you may be at different parts of this journey right now inside of your own firms. So take us all the way back to 2020 is what I have on the screen there, Marcus. I'm yeah. Sure and, plant the seed. and like, this is my, uh, like, this is our family uh, photo album. So if I tear up or get emotional, just look away. Right. So, um, but 2020, it was a, a big year. There, there was something going on in the world called COVID. Uh, so we actually used COVID as an opportunity to go fully remote. So we actually still have an office building in KD. We actually subleased most of that still, but to actually go remote, and I know a lot of firms want to do that or want to move to a hybrid, we had to get very clear on structure. Um, that's just a requirement of going remote, not being able to walk down the hall and touch your team members. So we started planting the seeds. We started adopting the language of the titles that were gonna be used. I think Rachel started to use those with prospects at that time. And so we started to loosely play with, okay, instead of being called an accountant or a bookkeeper, you're really a client service manager uh, and in charge of this. So um, 2020, it was also a year when we actually sold off our A&A practice. So um, as far as a legacy CPA firm, uh, DBA did it all at one time, right? So we did a lot of tax, we did A&A, &A, and in, at, in 2020, we made the call like, we're not going to pursue a a opportunities any longer and actually sold off that practice to a regional firm. So we needed to uh, recover that revenue and leaned into CAS. We, we thought there was a future in CAS. So we started planting the seeds in 2020 and that was just the start, right? We started to fill people out and make adjustments as needed. Um, 2021, we had some team members uh, that were kind of adopting that language and those different roles and we could start to see, okay, this is actually working. They know what clients they're gonna work on from week to week or from month to month. And the client knows who's also working on their accounting on a month to month basis. Like, duh, you know, it's like, make it make sense. So instead of this first in first out across the board, you know, whether it was bookkeeping or payroll or tax returns, we were starting to have clear set teams for client service. So that brought us to 2021. And uh, as Amy and I were preparing for this series, it's amazing to look back at not only the pictures of the teams that we had at that time, but then the financial pictures, right? You know, like the data, the financials. And so we'll share some of that um, in the future webinar. So make sure that you put those on your calendar. Um, but that brings us to 2022. So CAS clients, they, we were starting to actually sell this stuff. Like people were actually buying it. Who would have thought? And uh, this team of three model where you have both client service manager, client controller, that was really good enough, right? Just those two roles um, were good enough to go to market. We added on the advisory piece of the client CFO and that's what everybody wanted. That's what everybody got a taste of in COVID. Whenever you were advising on PPP and ERC and cash flow and all that good stuff. So did they just think that was gonna go away? in 2022 when it was back to smooth sailing? No, and, and we had to have a solution for how are we gonna take this data and go over this with clients on an ongoing basis? So that's whenever we really filled out the team of three and kind of put those roles in place. We actually elevated some team members and kind of got team members in the right spots based on their skill set and their availability. So that was 2022. So all things were going, we were actually selling, uh, or converting, which we'll talk about that too, uh, clients into this model. And then that brings me to 2023. Uh, we looked up at in 2023 and this time last year, and I'm like, what is broken? The efficiency of the team was all over the place. We had some clients we were making money on. We had some clients that were just dragging us down. And whenever you step away from your business and come back with fresh eyes or ask yourself, what would the next owner do in this situation? It made all the sense in the world. And we had too many team members working with one another. So we actually 
created the teams of three initially based on team member availability. So if this CSM had availability to take a client, they got that client, same with the controller, same with that CFO, and we just kind of built out the teams and the service model haphazardly, right? And so in March of 2023, we went from 40 different teams of three with a small team, uh, less than 20 people in the history of DBA, but probably FTE equivalents of about 15 at that time. So we went from 40 different teams of three down to 14. And so by doing that, we went back to that pod structure and that organizational structure to where this CSM is going to work with this client controller, maybe another client controller, but no more than two client controllers. And both of those client controllers are going to work under this CFO. That was a big shift for us. And what it also allowed us to do is build up industry expertise into the teams of three. So Leslie, who leads a pod, she actually has an industry expertise in vet clinics and her team, one leg of her pod, serves vet clinics really, really well. And whenever you gain that industry expertise, you start to see the same things over and over. You start to ask the same questions over and over. And so it's just going deeper into those industries by, by seeing that. And so we continued to evolve and now um, in 2024, kind of hitting stride in January, we've only got nine different teams of three. And after some transition, we'll actually probably go down to eight um, in the near future. Yeah, which I think a couple questions came in about that, right? Like, so how how high we went up to having 40 different variations. So as a CSM, you're working with multiple different controllers, right? And as a CFO, you're working with multiple controllers. Um, and then just pairing that down with very uh, being very intentional, right? Which increases internal teamwork. Yeah. Right. And just like you that, said, the ability to have your niches on various different pod legs. So I'm going yeah. to take us back one. Let me just go back one slide because I think Kenny and Joe, both your questions a little bit. Uh, this will help here. You know, if we think of a leg, it would be like CFO, client controller, CSM is one leg. Yeah. So really a CFO is managing maybe four different legs inside of here so yeah. we have i think you have six right now marcus and leslie has four legs maybe I don't know. as long as i have more like so i can have bragging rights that's fine is that what it is okay uh, i don't want more i want less <laughs> do you have anything to add to the slide should i move us along no so i think the the question did come in um and we we learned from that i think kenny had that question um so we had too many csms working with too many different controllers and whenever we would meet, like myself as a CFO or Leslie as a CFO, like, why isn't this project moving along? Why are these financials always issued after the 15th of the month? The controllers would say, well, I don't know what all that CSM has on their plate. Like my, my clients may just be a very small portion of what's on that CSM's plate. So I really don't know what all they have. And so that was part of it. Like we just have to get really clear on what people have on their plate. And that in a remote environment, you have to know what team members capacity is. It was 50% of you said that was the main thing. And so knowing what every person in the organization, as far as a capacity standpoint, not only helped us become more efficient and effective, but it also helped us prepare for new prospects and clients to come in the door and then assign those new prospects and those new clients based on which team has capacity. The other thing that I just blew over, uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so when we reshuffled in 2023, in March of 2023, we were so inefficient that we actually went from 40 down to 15 and actually exited two low performing team members, one client controller and one client service manager. So we actually not only became way more efficient, but we became more profitable. So like that's also the other part that we saw in that this time last year, whenever we looked at the rework. Yeah. So I'm gonna address one question that came through. So Terry's asking, so a team of three is seven people total? So in a, in a perfect world. A team of three is a team of three working on one client, but a pod would be- A pod be, is seven people. Yeah. 
And that's um, even DBA, which we'll get into, right? Um, we we don't have a full pod um, within DBA because we've we've actually chosen not to. We actually hire a lot of working parents. Uh, I'm the only male, so you can figure out that a lot of those working parents are working moms. So the thing about that is not everybody wants to work a full-time position. So we have a lot of part-time CSMs. We have a lot of part-time controllers. Leslie's even a part-time CFO. So I think that's the piece where it can look however you want it to, but a team of three is three dedicated people that are serving that client on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Which we're already servicing clients inside of all of the firms sitting here on this call today, right? The work's getting done. It's just how structured is it? So let's jump back to a question for all of you listening. Where is your firm at regarding the team of three structure? Right, because again, you're doing some type of a variation of it potentially. So give us some insight. If you pick other, feel free to share with us. And then while those questions are coming in, uh, we're getting lots of great questions, Marcus. I'm glad you're going through those. I think Rachel's trying to address some in the background as well. So. A lot of these we'll cover. Um, you know, Kevin's asking before team of three, Marcus, you're doing write up, data entry, et cetera, right? You were doing all of these things. How was the upselling to those clients? Uh, when, when appropriate, we could upsell. So I think uh, the hard truth that nobody is willing to tell you about upselling your clients um, to CAS services or advisory services. The hard truth in that is you probably need to go find new clients. So that being said, you're only going to upsell a small handful, or that's been our experience. But addressing your capacity, going up on pricing when appropriate, and finding that right mix of value for those clients, that, that was what we did. And then we did that over time. Um, some of you know my story where I'll uh, block and exit clients and um, get some cash flow to go do crazy things like build models like this. So part of that, um, we saw it as giving blood. So we had a blood bank of clients and we couldn't give all those clients at one time or all the blood is gone and we can no longer survive. So I think that was part of it. We made small transitions over time to where we're at today and where we only serve less than 100 clients today. Yeah. Lots of change. All right, really quick poll results. We've got them up on the screen. Let's talk about these before we move along. So, okay, about over half are doing a variation. It just needs a lot of improvement. The other ones that came through are um, trying to do this, but need CSMs for more efficient workflow, right? So just maybe missing a role there and others are at implementation stage. So yeah. thank you everyone for answering that for us. We appreciate it. And I'll, I'll stop right there. Like team of three is a model. Like it's not like we haven't, everybody asked me this, like, are you going to go patent that or trademark it or whatever? If I do that, then I have to monitor all that crap. So go figure this out, go do it yourself, go evolve it and tell me how you've improved it so I can improve it in my own firm. Um, Andy Stanley, who's a pastor I listen to in a leadership podcast, He's got a famous quote that says, you marry the mission and you date the model. Dating the model, team of three is the model. Our mission is the work that we do for our clients and how we do that with our team members. So we are constantly evolving at DBA. Team of three is what is working right now and we're, we're continuing to play with that. So even like if you don't have CSMs or some of those base level employees, what does it look like to go outsource part of that with TOA or with integrity or whoever that could be for you as opposed to trying to find that person in-house. So there are multiple iterations of this you could do. I think the structure itself is just a beginning. Yeah. A question came through, how does how did your staff handle the change? And we have some of them on. Should we unmute them and let them answer that? Or 
<laughs> we'll get into that. Listen for an upcoming podcast about that. Yeah, so Rachel and I have a podcast. Um, and on an upcoming podcast, we actually have two of our team members, one client service manager, Amada Santos, and one of our client uh, controllers, Elena Munoz, who are actually part of my pod. Uh, we serve dental clients uh, really well. And so I think you'll hear from both of them. Uh, Rachel and I interview them and they have some of that feedback. But I would say overall, it's been, it's, it's provided clarity for our team because they know what clients they work on from month to month, from week to week. They also know what service offering that client has opted into, and then they can serve that client really, really well. Because we do uh, employ a lot of working parents, we know the limits on that plate. And the reason why we don't go over time is because we know exactly how much to fill or take things off of that plate of service um, for that for that team member. So I think that's the other piece where those inherent um, wins by rolling this out, going back to 2020, people just thought I was full of it. Like, what's the catch? Like, what's the angle? You know, am I still gonna work 80 hours a week or whatever that is for the industry? But no, it was really like, we need to move toward this because our team is way more important than any one client. And so if we go through this and lose a client because they don't fit the service model, then we'll go find another client is how we think about it. Yeah, that's so very, very well received, right? As working through kinks is ultimately what was experienced over here at DBA. We have put together, again, we'll do our next series will really be financial impact where we dig into numbers, but just some high level here, the effect that we experienced over here with yeah. just being more intentional with structure. So you already touched on it, Marcus, like 31% in efficiency was ultimately the increase in number of clients that we were able to handle while also decreasing the number of team members that we had. Um, just allowing everyone to be more efficient. Profitability that, only went up 15%, you know? Like decreasing team members, that's not dirty. Like, you know, it's one of those things like we really want to see people like kill it wherever they, wherever they go, right? And it was just that as part of that transition, some things came to light and we were able to exit some low performing team members. And because of that, we the way that we calculated this, we looked at number of CAS clients um, and divided it by FTEs or full-time equivalents. And we compared that and based on the clients that we're able to serve, that 31% is actual number, right? That's not theory. And that's hopefully what you're getting out of this today. Like we don't have it all figured out, but this is what we have seen. So 31% is that number of cl CAS clients served divided by FTEs starting from 2021 to 2024. We yeah, really 2021 right, was our first, yeah, it was the year that we thought would be a good base because we had figured stuff out by then, so. Yeah, yeah. Same with profitability, then that was the increase in gross profit margin is what we were looking at there based on that client base. Correct. Right? Yep, so we looked at total revenue for our CAS and tax um, side and the number of team members and production team that serves those uh, clients really, really well. And we saw a gross profit increase of 15%. Which is low for Marcus, he's disappointed in this number. 15% increase. So like, that's the piece where I was like, yeah, that didn't look that great. But uh, so I think we went from gross profit, was it, uh, I don't know, help me out here, Amy, was it 55% to 70%? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, you think about a CPA firm or professional services and that old rule of thumb, a third, a third, a third, right? You know, a third labor, a third general administrative and a third going to profit. Um, you can hold true to that. And so I think that that 70% gross profit margin is really good. That allows us to treat our team really, really well, um, take them, on shopping sprees to buy new yoga pants and all that fun stuff. So I think that's the piece where we wanted to provide a business that did that, but not only provided great financial incentives, but really a, a balanced life. And so I think that was the piece that people were looking for in a, in a job or a role outside of accounting, inside of accounting, who wouldn't want it, so. 
Yeah. The ability to help others while not sacrificing your life outside of work. Yeah. 99% increase in client service. We do have one client who could do without the extra that we do for everyone, but you know what? Yeah. (laughs) Well, and that's a, so we send out NPS surveys, right? So we've done those a couple of years and the feedback that we get from clients is really good. Um, So we don't wait until, it's hit the fan, so to speak, and then they blast us on Google. Like we try to stay in front of those clients. And one client actually said, I really enjoy everything the team does, but I don't need these monthly financials. Well, you're still gonna receive the monthly financials because like that's part of our program. And so for we don't we wanna remove any decision making across the team. And so if we let one client not receive financials, then does the next one not? And I think those are the pieces where not everybody's always going to give you 100%. So it just makes sense. Like he still enjoys this, but he just doesn't care about the financials. Yeah, just don't look at them, right? Just you don't have to look at them. So those were three areas that we highlighted. Just impact that is felt with a team of three structure listed on the screen. I mean, there's a ton of impact there. Any of these jump out at you, Marcus, to share a DBA story? So uh, capacity, we've kind of hit on a lot. Clarity, we've hit on communication with clients. They actually know who to call and who to ask for whenever they call. Uh, This came up in a recent conversation, you know, when we did not define who their team was, any of your client calls your office and who do they ask for? They ask for you. And that's not the person that they need to talk to. So I think that's a lot of pieces that were improvement um, along the way. And so there's, clients in Leslie's pod that I've never even spoken with. Like they, that team handles them really, really well. And for them to get a phone call from me or to even call me, it would be out of the ordinary. Culture I think has improved uh, quite a bit. I think DBA has seen um, a lot of improvement there going back to like those early, early days. Um, It's just a completely different organization. Delegation is my favorite word. And so I think that's one of my, Uh, pieces where as you're able to have a structure in place to where you can delegate roles and responsibilities and it's not dirty it's delegate to somebody that has time availability and can do that job maybe even better than you can that is a huge win for people across the organization and so what team of three allows us to do is it allows us to delegate as much as we possibly can to the roles that really are the best for it and continue to build a healthy organization you compare that to most firms that I, you ask any firm out there and what position are you looking for? You're looking for a tax manager, a tax senior manager, or a tax director. And those people don't exist. They've exited the industry or their partners or they started their own firms because they don't wanna work in a firm that's so top heavy and where the partners work the most hours in the business. So I think by having a model where you can get work done, you can get paid for really great work and allow different levels of team members to do that work is the goal and or it was our goal right and so i think those are the things that kind of allowed for both efficiency profitability and client service because we we just address those and the other thing that this has done and i don't know that we've talked about it or will um, it actually provides a roadmap for a team member to go throughout the organization and and maybe that's their career path Because I know uh, Tina actually asked that question. Have you had anyone that both doubles as a CSM and a client controller? And they don't double as it. We've tried that and it failed. Um, They actually move from CSM to client controller with the right amount of support and with the right amount of training. So I think that's the piece where if you come into an organization and your career path is really solid, you want to go from CSM to client controller to CFO to eventual owner, um, I think that's the piece that, that we all have to keep in mind is what is that career path for those, for those individuals? And as mentioned, we have a lot of working parents that are just okay being a CSM for this stage of life. Maybe one day in the future, they want another, another rung on the ladder. That's fine. We'll talk about it then, but for right now, let's just stay here and do really, really good work. Yeah. Just growth inside of each role. Right. There's also the potential there because you don't necessarily have to move up the ladder, just continue to expand and grow inside of the role that you're in. So this is 
fabulous information. Marcus, we appreciate you sharing your brain, your experience with DBA. Um, when, you know, about over half of the people listening today are either, we're already doing this because they're inside of DBA and they know it needs improvement, continual improvement, but over half are doing a variation of this. And so, you know, it's February, we're talking about this. For those of you that aren't doing it, planning is where we're at right now, right? It takes just as much energy to wish as it does to plan how to make and tweak changes inside of the structure inside of your firm. Any words of advice for your friends out there Yeah. in February? Well, I couldn't buy lunch today, but at least we could provide some entertainment. Uh, I would say, if anything, like this hour has been a break from your day, whatever you've got going on, client phone calls, client meetings, reviewing tax returns, hopefully you're there. Hopefully uh, you've got some tax returns coming in to review. But I think the thing is like, what seeds can be planted today and grown uh, from today? You know, the when, you, when you're in the most painful of situations is when it's the most real. And so for us, pain and tax season usually go hand in hand. And uh, I remember the big, the big, events in my life all started in tax season. So I remember whenever I went to go see if I could buy a firm and wrote uh, 40 different letters to CPAs, I sent those out during tax season, not only because that was the lowest of the low for me that time of year, but also for them. And if they got that letter in the mail and said, oh, this kid wants to buy my firm, it's more likely that they may sell it to me versus in July or August, whenever they forgot how bad it was. So I would say document how bad it is right now. Maybe it's not bad. Maybe we just need to make some small tweaks, but I would say do something. And I've got a friend, Don Brolin, who is much more energetic around saying that, uh, just do something and document it, move forward, plan on what it's gonna look like. You know, if it's doing something by registering for those future webinars just so you have momentum and accountability do that maybe it's putting something on your calendar after tax season to where you get away and you really think about your business like what do you really want it to look like and who can help you do that so i think those are the pieces that if you walk away from today just do something don't go back to that tax return don't return that phone call or type that email actually make some initiative to where you want to be in the future. I think that's great advice. Great. And you hit on what we have up on the screen here is, you know, analyze where is that pain? So is it in current structure inside of the firm? And what do you want to, it to look like? What could be a tweak that you could make that you don't have to make right now, but just getting those thoughts out, right, would be the important piece because making the change now may not be the most ideal time it may be you know let's wait let's get let's get to the other side of april um maybe the other side of may and really start to think about actually implementing those changes but then also what are those roles and what are those responsibilities which is what a lot of the questions that have been coming through are about you know what is each person doing are we utilizing outside people uh, which will cover a lot of that in roles and responsibilities. There's also already free resources out there for you that give you detailed information on CFO, controller, and CSM role and what that looks like for present, past, future, the opposite way there. But. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, just the easy thing, like maybe this isn't enough. Maybe you need something else, right? So maybe your firm just took a picture and sent it out on a Christmas card to your clients, right? So start with that picture. Who's on the team today? Hopefully you have a full team. Hopefully no one's left in the last 45 days and left you in a weird position. Take that picture and start to think about those people. Like where would they fit? Where, where's their skill set best? Like where do you see them killing it and you know, moving forward? And so think about the org chart. You're also gonna have it, you're going to have gaps in that org chart. And those are the people that you need to go find. Instead of posting that job for the thousandth tax manager that no one's going to hire, go actually see who it is you need. And maybe it's somebody that you can retrofit into a certain skill set. 
So I think an org chart is very, a very easy exercise to think through. And that, you know, maybe something where you get even a little bit more creative. Maybe you cut people's heads out of that picture and start putting them into things, do that electronically or AI. You can go crazy with it, right? The other piece is don't try to do all this yourself. Like if you scan that QR code, you go out to DBA Farm Resources, our structure is there, our uh, roles and responsibilities. You go to our website, we always have the client service manager and the client controller jobs live on our website. Just go take them, like they're yours. So I think those are the pieces that don't reinvent the wheel yourself, don't get stuck at the blinking cursor and talk yourself out of change. Just do something. And th those are great steps to, to start with. As simple as that, right? One foot in front of the other. Yep. And if you That'll want suck. me to call you or come visit you and like actually make you do it, we can talk about that, you know? So I think those are the pieces that, um, you know, just do something and if you do nothing today scan that qr code uh the future webinars those dates i think will be sent to you after this as well we you know obviously love your feedback too so um but yeah you'll find webinar registration on our dba firm um, website so if you do scan that qr code and go out there but i'm curious have you signed up for free resources so are you connected are you getting emails from us that will help you not have to reinvent the wheel as marcus said there just sharing what has worked inside of dba so that you can take that and tweak it to make it work inside of your firm And for those of you that are saying, no, please sign me up. Amy, do they have to go scan that QR code? Is that the best way? And then drop in their information? No, we will actually do it. Okay. Rachel and I will take care of that for you. So no need to do it. If you've got a task return to review after you make a one note of what you want to change, by all means. Um, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. A lot of you are already signed up. So here are the dates again for our upcoming webinars. They are um, obviously taking a break just as we go through the next couple months here. We understand it's going to be busy, we'll be busy. So April 18th will be the financial advantages of the team of three structure. We'll, we will dive deeper into the numbers and capacity planning and what all of that looks like. And then May 16th, we'll really dive into roles and responsibilities what does that specifically look like? And then on June 20th, we'll get into implementation and execution strategy and lessons learned there, potholes to avoid and have success. Do we have a webinar not as part of this series in March? Um, I do not believe so. Okay. But for all of you that are signed up and will be signed up, we will keep you informed if one lands out there. Cool. Because we may just get bored and want to talk to all of you again. So I think that's the piece where these dates are set for this scale series, but watch your email. Never know what's well, going to come. Marcus has a loose tax background, so he would like to avoid tax review and actually do something else. That's really what it is. Uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Marcus, thank you for sharing all of your insight and experience inside of DBA, what you've gone through. We appreciate everyone being here. We hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Go do something. As Marcus right. would say. Let's go do something, guys. We'll see you on the other one. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. So this was recorded and we'll get you all access to the recording.